advance workforce and and climate action in Congress. And I, I, I can't start without thanking my amazing staff, Allie and my whole team uh, in uh, Oregon and DC. I can't do what I do without them and I wanna acknowledge them. So we're gonna start with a round of introductions just to make sure everyone knows everyone. Uh, and then I'll make some brief remarks and then open it up for, for discussion and conversation because uh, I really want this to be a, a two-way conversation. So I'll just go across the screen and in order the, and the way that people are on my screen and we'll do a brief introduction uh, uh, starting with Marshall. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Marshall McGrady. I'm with IBW Local 48 and I am the political director there. Thanks for joining us, Darren. It looks like we don't have Daron on audio yet, but let me let me send a message here. Oh, okay. can Darone? you hear us? Okay, let's we'll we'll circle back. Daron is connecting to to uh, audio. Mark. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Barrell. I'm the sales manager for A and R Solar here in Tualatin. I also live up on off of Butner Road in your district. Terrific. Thanks for joining us, Kelly. Good afternoon, Congresswoman Bonamici. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with all of these fantastic folks. And thank you for your leadership in making sure that the work we're doing uh, for climate change and improving our environment also includes improvements for workers and workforce. We really appreciate you. I'm Kelly Kupchak with Oregon Tradeswomen. Happy to be here today. Thanks for joining us. And I, I'm going to skip. We, I, we have COIN and KATU with us. So I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, next is Meredith. Hi, everyone. Hi, Congresswoman. Nice to see you. I'm Meredith Connolly, the Oregon Director of Climate Solutions, and really excited to talk about my favorite topic of the intersection of climate and good jobs. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go back and see if Daron, are you uh, connected to audio now for introductions? Terrific. I am. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Daron Coles. I'm the Executive Director of the Blueprint Foundation. We're a workforce development nonprofit. Uh, for the green sector, and we work primarily with African American youth and adults here in Portland. Terrific, welcome. Thank you, Sage. Thank you, Congresswoman. I appreciate you hosting this. Uh, Sage Learn. I am the Director of Government Relations with Portland Community College. Great, welcome, Brooke. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Congresswoman, for um, inviting us to participate. My name is Brooke Brownlee. I'm the State Legislative Affairs Manager for Portland General Electric, and we look forward to the conversation. Terrific. Glad you're here. David. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting us. Uh, I am here representing Work Systems uh, Inc., our regional workforce board in uh, the Portland area. I sit on the executive committee of the board. Uh, Andrew McGuff, the director, asked me to participate today. I also, uh, as my day job, work at Portland General Electric and managing our workforce training and development. And I agree with Meredith. The, the connection between climate and jobs is definitely a passion of mine. So I'm very looking forward to the conversation. I will just say, I'm a little distracted today. I woke up with <laughs> some bruising under my eye. So oh, okay. if I'm turning this way so you can't see it, um, it's, uh, it may seem a little awkward, but I'm just, well, we hope you're that. okay. Thanks. We I, hope you're okay. I just met with a doctor and I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Good. Candace, welcome. Hey, good morning, everyone. Candace Avila, she, her pronouns here. I'm the executive director at Verde. Thanks for joining us. Next is Tom. Hello, my name is Tom Pribish. I'm the president of Northwest Engineering Service, uh, but I'm primarily here representing PCC. Um, I had uh, helped develop and uh, taught some classes for the renewable energy program there. Excellent, thank you. And Michelle? Um, good morning, everyone from the doorway into the doorway out. And thank you, Congresswoman. My name is Michelle Marr. I am the programs manager at the Oregon Solar Energy Industries Association, working on primarily workforce development. And I also coordinate the licensed renewable energy technician apprentice program. Thank you. And I got everybody right. Terrific. Well, I'm really eager to share an update on where things stand with workforce development and climate action in Congress, but then really to hear, to hear from you. 
So I serve on the Education Labor Committee as well as the Committee on Science, Space and Technology and on the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis where I'm actually the only member from the Pacific Northwest. And I recently helped to represent the United States at the UN Climate Change Conference or the COP26 in Glasgow. So we know uh, that climate change is now an undeniable part of our daily lives and we're at a pivotal time to address it with climate action. We have seen wildfires, ice storms, heat, the heat dome, the effects on our ocean, the deadly tornadoes, uh, these extreme weather events across the country and around the globe. And we know there's a lot at stake. And we know that because the last report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, highlighted that climate change is needed urgently. It's a red alert for humanity, they said. And failure to reduce emissions is not an option. But importantly, climate action also means jobs. And I'm gonna make sure that workers and students are ready to step into these jobs. And I know that's why we're here for this important conversation today. Uh, workforce development is essential. And I, I note that we are still in a pandemic uh, and we've not made the investments necessary yet to make sure we fully recover from the pandemic and that our recovery is equitable. So we'll, we'll, we'll put that out there in addition to the uh, the, the climate issue, as well as we're going to talk about infrastructure a bit. So, so this discussion comes at a very important time because it's critical that workers have access to quality paid on the job training and importantly support services they need to get these good paying high quality jobs. And that's true for people who lost their jobs during the pandemic. It's true for those who want to help build the infrastructure that we will be building to, uh, to, to help our economy and also to address the climate crisis. And it's true for those who see the tremendous potential uh, with our transition to clean energy. And we also need to support workers who have historically faced barriers to employment, especially women and people of color. And I've seen the power of workforce training programs in Northwest Oregon. I've spoken with people in these programs who really inspired me to fight for robust investment in workforce development. Um, for example, I remember a conversation I had with Lacey, who said her registered apprenticeship, that's what she said, made it possible for me to pay my bills and feed my kid. And she said she didn't know where she would be without it. And with all of these workers in mind, I fought hard all year to secure workforce funding, which is currently at $20 billion in the Build Back Better Act, which is of course passed the House and is pending in the Senate. This workforce funding will help more people access the infrastructure and clean energy and manufacturing jobs that the bipartisan infrastructure bill and Build Back Better will help create. And workforce boards, labor unions, community colleges, community-based organizations, small businesses, and others are training and supporting the unemployed and underemployed workers, but there's a tremendous amount of potential, and they are in urgent need of more resources. So I'll continue to advocate for workforce funding in Build Back Better and also beyond. Uh, recently, I helped lead the update of the National Apprenticeship Act, which had not been updated since the 1930s, and you know, a few things have changed since the 1930s. Hmm. Um, and I'm also advocating for my Bipartisan Partners Act and Bipartisan Builds Act to expand on paid on-the-job training opportunities to communities that have historically been left behind, and also to help small and medium-sized businesses offer more work-based learning programs. Uh, I'm going to take a minute just to highlight the bipartisan infrastructure law, which was a, a, a major accomplishment uh, now signed into law uh, and beginning implementation, but I just want to emphasize, as you all know, we need people to do this work. Uh, it's going to bring, bring billions of dollars of much needed investment. In Oregon, for example, $3.4 billion for highways, $747 million for public transit, $529 million for clean drinking water, $268 million for bridge replacement and repairs, $100 million for broadband, $52 million for electric vehicle charging. That's a lot of good paying jobs to fill. And there will be many more as we take action on climate. And I want to note why workforce development is so critical to our success, especially in, in dress, addressing the climate crisis. The opposition, and I've seen this over the years, the opposition to taking action to transition to a clean energy economy is often based on concern about people losing jobs. 
but the goal is to put more people to work uh, and help grow our economy. And there's a tremendous potential for Oregon to be at the forefront of the economic benefits of this transition. And it's also important to keep in mind that the consequences of inaction will be devastating for workers and families. And we saw that over the summer here in Oregon with the heat dome. We're just listening to an interview this morning about children who lost their homes in the tornadoes last weekend. We see more frequent, more extreme weather events and how the climate crisis is affecting uh, people's health, homes, and lives. So we want to keep this in mind. And, and I think back, um, my grandfather, my, my Italian grandfather, um, he was a coal miner in Western Pennsylvania. After he got off the boat at Ellis Island, he went to Western Pennsylvania and, and worked in a coal mine um, until he lost his leg uh, in the coal mine uh, in, a, in an accident. And I think about you know, what that meant. Um, we, we know that we need to make sure that People like my grandfather can have a job in a safe working environment that is safe for workers and safe for communities and safe for our country and our planet. So I'm focused on supporting workers as we make this transition to a clean energy economy. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you today and bring together uh, your ideas and your expertise. I'm glad to be your partner at the federal level for that combination of, of climate action and the good jobs that come with it. So I'm gonna open it up to discussion. And I, and I wanna start by asking, what, what is working in the efforts that you're seeing currently uh, to create climate uh, jobs in Oregon? Uh, and what are the gaps and what could we be doing better? And, and I'll open it up for discussion. You can either just uh, wave the old fashioned way, use the, the um, raise hand function in Zoom, uh, just to start talking until that gets uh, um, to be problematic, but um, anyone can start. Uh, I just wanted to hear from all of you because you bring so much uh, to, to the issue and like to hear uh, what's working uh, and what are the gaps and what can we be doing better? Who would like to start? Can start us off. Terrific, thank you. Hey everyone, so again, Candace here from Verde. Um, thank you again for bringing this uh, group of folks in the Zoom room to have this discussion. Uh, real quick, I'll just give you the brief, what is Verde? Um, so Verde, we are an environmental justice organization that predominantly does a lot of our work in Kelly, but it also spans across Oregon, um, because as we know, to make change in our local communities, we have to work at intergovernmental levels to do that. Um, our mission is to build environmental wealth um, in low income and people of color communities through our social enterprises, our outreach and our advocacy programs. And so I think that from our perspective, as far as um, what's working and what are the gaps, um, there's definitely substantial funding for workforce development that's coming in through the Portland Clean Energy Fund. Um, and we as an organization have been working to uh, maximize those dollars and put them back into um, those kinds of programs. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we feel that HB 2021, um, the labor standards in that bill will really help create strong pipelines. But what's important to remember is that pipelines are not enough. And we need programs that can provide the career support, tracking of workforce, sustainability, and training for employers on how to manage and support diverse workforces. And the renewable energy uh, industry is mostly white, mostly male. We've heard lots of stories from folks that um, people are not able to stay in these companies because of the micro and macro aggressions that they're facing. So really addressing that and ensuring that we're creating um, this workplace to be um, welcoming for the communities that we're trying to funnel into them. Um, we cannot uh, continue to do that without providing that extra support, that equity lens, um, the racial justice lens that intersects with economic justice and environmental justice. Thank you. And Candace, thank you so much. It was very, very helpful to hear um, when we wrote the um, Climate Action Plan, the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, we sort of wove environmental justice throughout with the understanding that climate change has disproportionately affected uh, people of color, low-income communities. So that is 
uh, environmental justice is really critical, and I really appreciate the uh, the, the concern about having um, safe workplaces and making sure that once people get into the jobs, that these are are safe, uh, welcoming uh, workplaces as well. I see Kelly next. Thank you. Thanks, Congresswoman. And I just want to echo um, what Candace said. Candace, I appreciate you uh, framing it that way because I do think what we're doing well is we have a lot of training available. Workforce development programs are there. Um, our community organizations and community college network uh, are trying to work more closely together and collaborate so that uh, industry certifications and credentials can help folks um, move from poverty to prosperity in these good high wage, high road jobs, but we need to do a better job in making sure that folks from communities of color and women who continue to be underrepresented in these really good jobs um, have an opportunity for the training. But also as Candace said, the working environment has been historically hostile to folks that look like many of us on the, on the call and we know we need to do better there through job site culture training programs and those wraparound and support services. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to ensure that working together with high road policies and thank you Congresswoman Bonamici for leading those efforts in everything you do across the board. We are so grateful for your work and your commitment to equity because when we talk about you know, the triple bottom line, I, I you know, the pe people, planet, profit, for us, it's about environment, economy, and equity, and we need to lead with an equity lens if we're gonna make a difference. Um, so I think we have a lot more work to do and build on the assets we have. Thank you, Kelly. I really appreciate that. And uh, Oregon Tradeswomen is really making a difference here in Oregon, where we have a higher percentage than many other states of women in the trades. And we've had some good conversations about the, the importance of, again, making sure that uh, the workplaces are safe and welcoming as well. So uh, we'll, we'll be learning from the, the, the lessons already learned here in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest and really bringing those, those examples with, a, with the understanding that there's still work to do. I see David next, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanna echo what Kelly and Candace said. So I support a lot of those sentiments and a lot of the gaps and a lot of the work that needs to be done in that space. I will say, um, I have seen an increase in awareness of what the clean energy economy is and how jobs play a crucial role um, to supporting the growth and advance advancement of the clean energy economy. You know, I've had conversations with groups from Southern Oregon to Central Oregon, and everyone's excited. Everyone's excited for the future, right? We're we're hoping and keeping our fingers crossed that federal legislation will happen. Um, there's been some state investment, um, and then there's local investment down to PISA, right, Candace. And I just think, you know, just generally speaking, there's more awareness, there's more commitment, there's more, there's more thinking happening on the part of nonprofit, public, and private institutions, and just part of the population of Oregon to say, you know, what is this industry? And I think where there's a gap is the articulation, the, the description of what the clean energy economy is when it comes to jobs. Like what's the breadth of those jobs? Everything from engineers to telecommunications, to field crews, to building electrification, to transportation electrification, to all these emerging technologies that are occurring in, in the energy industry. And I think there's a real need to articulate that, to describe it, to build some awareness and education around that. Because when I talk to organizations and, and people around this particular topic, a lot of people are saying, how do I get involved? What are the jobs that we can help train for? What are the occupations that we can you know, um, create some curriculum um, on uh, with community colleges or K through 12th grade institutions? So that's, that's what I just wanna to bring to the table is just, how can we build that awareness and education and say, hey, let's help, let's help you see yourself in this space. Let's help you tie your training programs and educational programs to this space. That, that's really helpful. I have a brief follow-up and then I see Duran, Meredith, and then Brooke. But David, 
where do you think the increased awareness is coming from? And can you think of uh, opportunities to further increase that awareness and really the, heighten the, the awareness and, and increase the amount of information that people have about the job potential and opportunities? Yeah, that's such a good follow-up question, Congresswoman. And I think you know the group here at the table can help help answer that question. But really, really quickly, I think PSA is driving, at least in the Portland, Portland metropolitan region, a lot of that interest, a lot of that uh, curiosity. Um, and I think from the state level, we're looking at renewable energy development projects. We're looking at communities that are impacted by climate change, by wildfires, by higher, you know, hotter temperatures. Um, I think there's a lot to do. That might be a, a maybe a, a, a longer conversation. But you know, I have some thoughts on like what what we can do from the federal, state, and local level, as well as the public and nonprofit level to create that awareness. Because I think it's sounds it's like not a just great, one entity, great topic for a, like a, a whole conversation about that increasing awareness. So that's really helpful. Thank you, David. So Duran, and then after Duran, uh, Meredith, Brooke, Mark, and Marshall. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to keep this short. I've been taking copious notes. I agree with everything that folks. Uh, have been saying, and I just want to add on to it. Uh, uh, and I'll, I, I'll start with um, uh, Candace, uh, your remarks. I think that we definitely need to do more equity training for existing businesses. But I think if we're talking about uh, this is sort of an and, not a or, uh, and we need to think about economic development through entrepreneurship. And so uh, as we think about that transition from these workforce development programs to uh, entry level work, yes, it matters where they land, uh, but it also matters uh, if folks that want to own uh, businesses in the sector are able to do so. And so thinking about seed money for new businesses, uh, for people that are coming out of these training programs, I think it's really important if we really want uh, sort of authentic diversification of the industry. Uh, we want people that are able to employ uh, their friends, employ their neighbors, employ people that look like me uh, that are passionate uh, and, and skillful in, in, in this area. Uh, I also uh, wanted to back up another com uh, uh, comment uh, about workforce development. When does it start? And uh, uh, if we want awareness of these jobs, to me, workforce development needs to start extremely early. And so Blueprint Foundation has been uh, doing early learner programs for STEM to, to develop engineering design skills in preschool students uh, and talking about the jobs that come out of these skills uh, because we need them and the parents that we're working, the parents are co-creating these activities with us that are nature-based. And so it's helping parents become aware of the jobs early on so that throughout the, the child's uh, development, they can be saying, this is where you're going. This, these are the opportunities for you that are upcoming, not when they're seniors in high school, when they are in elementary school, when they're in middle school, where we lose most of the folks. We need folks like my mom out there, you know, a black mom that was struggling, but she said, my kids are gonna get an education, this one's gonna be a doctor, these two are going into engineering and I can't remember a moment in my life where she wasn't saying that, right? And so if we're talking awareness, it starts early and it really has to have multiple touch points. So parents, uh, family members need to be talking about this, friends of these students. So having cohorts of students learning about this is really important as well early on. I think that that's something uh, that we often miss and uh, I'm feeling passionate about it at the moment because I was just in a meeting and I was talking about workforce development. And then I mentioned early learners and someone said, well, that's not workforce development. And so we had to have a moment. Um, 
So I'll stop there and I'll give the floor to other people. <laughs> I, I very much appreciate uh, your, your comments. Uh, and, and as a, a member of the Education Labor Committee, I know how important those early learning years are. Uh, and uh, I, I, I also want to note that I'm a, a huge proponent of STEAM as well as STEM, integrating arts and design into STEM learning for, for creative, innovative thinking. And uh, my arts education bill for all will help with uh, early learning as well as uh, students in the juvenile justice the system all the way throughout to, to make sure that we have creative uh, problem solvers in, in the workforce. So, so thank you. I really appreciate your comments. And Meredith is next. Uh, wow. I, um, it's hard to follow all of these really um, astute comments that I think really put their finger on the pulse of where the need is, where the opportunity is. And I think uh, two things I would say. One is, I think in addition to all the workforce training needs and all the benefits that come from that economic benefit of um, having a good job in a in a you know innovative sector that's growing, um, which all these clean energy and electrification sectors can represent. It's also um, been really clear to me and impressed upon me how much it can make uh, workers' lives better. So I was just talking to a TriMet bus driver who's driving an electric bus instead of a diesel bus now. And she was telling me how much quieter, how much cleaner um, the experience is and just what a better day she has um, driving an electric bus. And I think that can be true across many different worker experiences in these new um, clean energy technologies. Uh, one other thing I, I will say, there was so much to love on transportation in the infrastructure package, but um, there is so much to do um, in the building sector here, and I think that's where Build Back Better can offer a huge opportunity for Oregon. We have, you know, homes and buildings that are not resilient to the wildfire smoke, um, the heat dome, as you mentioned, people died without affordable cooling um, and weatherized homes. Uh, it's it's a huge issue. And I think there are some really impressive things happening on the ground um, in the weatherization, holistic electrification. All of, how do you bring these solutions to bear, whether it's Community Energy Project, Verde, Candace's organization, uh, Rogue in Southern Oregon are doing some really amazing things um, with homes down there. And I, a lot of what I see in Build Back Better can tie together some of these whole house rebates and all of the, you know, all of these rebates and grant programs and all that, but tied also to training. And you can't export those jobs. Those are inherently local jobs. And that's what we really need to be doing house by house, building by building to transition to clean energy, energy saving buildings that are more comfortable and affordable for everyone. So I, I just really want to thank you for all you're doing to get this passed because I, we, we're not there yet, and there's a lot to do. There is, and I thank you so much. I really appreciate the stories you told about the, the one about the bus driver, especially because I got to ride on an electric school bus uh, in the Beaverton School District recently, and the bus driver said, same story. It's quieter. It's safer for the driver and the children and the people, you know, the passengers who are being transported on the bus. So yes, we still have a lot more to do, but that really makes it real to understand that the the, the people who are affected in their daily lives and work as well. Um, and thank you. You're you're absolutely right to mention the the need for uh, how we're building, how we're renovating. There's a significant investment in housing and affordable housing in the in the Build Back Better Act as well. Um, I remember touring uh, uh, housing, low-income housing, uh, uh, grand opening out in Hillsboro uh, that was built to a passive house standard. So uh, they were able to keep, it costs a little bit more upfront, but they significantly reduce energy costs for uh, people who live there. And it was quieter and it was cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter with lower costs. So as we as we look at those investments we can make and, and the people they affect, it's really critical to keep that in mind. So, so thank you so much. Next, I see Brooke and then Mark and then Marshall. 
Thank you. Um, so I would also echo every <laughs> everybody else's comments. I think you know the comments around the planning for workforce development, inclusion of the workforce is really important. Um, PGE has really been focusing on how do we take this awesome new package in House Bill 2021 that is aligned with our decarbonization goals and really help work with others to make sure that we have the workforce there. And that's such a critical point of making sure that this is realized in the way that this clean energy future we all envision it to be. Um, and that means that we're planning really thoughtfully about how do you have the workforce there to build all these cool new things um, and ensuring that folks that need additional supports at the beginning to help them get them on the path have those additional supports that they need. And um, is it, you know, do you need childcare to help you through a pre-apprenticeship program? Do you need, you know, some extra math classes? Like all those various types of things that really help to reduce the barriers to entry into this new future in which we all want to see. So we're really excited about this. And I, it's exciting to hear the momentum and excitement around this. And PGE looks forward to continuing to be a part of that um, and working with our coalition members in the state to really advance that forward. And Brooke, thank you so much for, for emphasizing the importance of those supports, uh, because we've heard that uh, again and again, whether it be childcare, huge challenge right now, as we know uh, that that's holding back uh, many people, particularly women, women of color tend to be childcare providers, but uh, there's a, an, an effort that I'm, I'm also very involved in to make sure that the childcare funding and build back better uh, gets through because it really makes a difference to, and, and that early childhood uh, part of life is so important. So with Build Back Better, there's the uh, affordable, accessible childcare as well as universal preschool. So thank you for, for mentioning that. And the, and the supports are so important, whether it be tools, uniforms, transportation, um, to, to get people through so they can complete their program and get those jobs. So, so thank you for mentioning that really important piece of what we're working on. Mark and then Marshall. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so again, um, sales manager for AR Solar. So AR started up in Seattle. It's based up there. In 2016, they opened a, the Portland office. And so they went from zero personnel, zero dollars, to today we have 23 full-time employees in Oregon who live right here. And we're doing about $10 million of business. That's amazing. We had a 50% increase in 2021. We had a 30% increase in sales in 2020. This is how dynamic this industry is. And how and but because of that we have difficulty getting more people, um, and this, uh, uh, management in this company guess what they all look like me, it's you know white men that's basically it. Now ha having said that we also realize and this th this goes back about three years ago or, or more that's a problem. Not only is a problem because we realize that we are failing not only the company and ourselves individually but our, the wider community that we serve. So we are actually, we've been a lot of strides internally with our equity group to, to, to make that, to make sure that we understand, we really need to reach out. We really need to find people that can help not only themselves, but our company grow in a way that the economy demands it. This, uh, we're doing solar and storage these days. We're very innovative. New products come out, we test them, we make things happen. So I just want to make sure that you know, people understand this industry is amazing. Uh, this bill in Congress now will make it even easier, I think, or it will help grow the industry and also provide the training that we actually, that, are, that we're seeking. Uh, we're gonna be growing again by another 50% next year. Secondly, I'm also, if I put my other hat on, on the board president for the Oregon Solar and Storage uh, Industry Association. Michelle is our uh, 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 project, uh, Michelle, what are you again? Project. You're so anyway, Michelle. So, and she's in charge of the uh, uh, the LRT program. And that's an incredibly important program because that we draw a lot of our employees or well, the field people from that. And uh, uh, she's making a big uh, pitch to say, look, we need to get women involved. We need to get people of color involved. We need to look at the larger uh, 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 sphere of, of potential candidates because we got to have these people. And if they don't understand, I think uh, Duran mentioned earlier that uh, he's reaching down to elementary school. Yeah, you got to go down there because people don't under, you know, still it's a very young industry. People don't really know, well, what's really out there? It's construction. 
It's really good paying jobs where uh, we're employee owned, we're a B Corp, I'm an employee owner, about half of our Oregon staff are employee uh, owners as well. So it gives them a buy-in to make this company a better company. Well, thank you, Mark. And I'm going to ask you and Michelle a follow up in terms of tell us a little bit about if you have a position open right now, uh, what, what what's the story of how, how you reach out to to find someone? Do you look for someone who, who you can train on the job? Do you need someone who already has the skills for the position? Tell us a little bit about the process that you go through now and, and where the challenges are in, in finding people to, to come and work at the company. Well, for uh, for field people, we need people you know who have basic construct really basic construction training. Can they swing a hammer? Can they turn a wrench? Can they use a ladder? Are they are they comfortable on a roof? Um, really basic stuff, and that's we've really found that there is a big gap. I went to a PCF meeting about two years ago, and that's that was a big issue that came up. There's a couple of solar people like myself, and I was like, yeah, we would love to hire more people, but we can't find the people who 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 have just enough skills so that we can then train them to do exactly the job that they need to do. So, uh, but that's being a uh, piece of it is actually going to close that. They are closing that gap. Uh, I think, you know, Veriday is doing uh, some things in that area as well. Other organizations uh, in Portland too, which is great because then we can find the people in those communities and actually hire them. And then we can continue on the training. When it comes to office uh, 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 jobs, it, it's very similar to any other business. It really depends if it's admin or if it's project management or if it's sales. Uh, uh, we try to reach out, but it's a little, it's in some ways it's, it's harder to do that. And we're trying to figure out, well, how do we get other people? How do we get the broader community involved to apply for these positions? Because we know they're out there. I, I wanna weigh in to, to your question. It's a really good question and thank you for asking. Um, us um, in terms of the probably the highest need is entry level solar installers and there's always a, um, a hope that solar installers will um, become an apprentice in the LRT apprenticeship program become an electrician or an LRT so that they right because that's all it's not um, it, it, that's central to solar installation the those licensed trades they also provide a living wage um, we are thankful that we've received PCEF funding to um, have um, uh, solar installation trainings that involve pre-apprentice programs like the Oregon Tradeswoman, Women um, and Constructing Hope. Um, I think that this um, could be expanded and that that would really strengthen the field. However, we also have a bottleneck because of some of the electrician um, requirements that I'm not gonna argue with those requirements, but we have a bottleneck in not having enough um, electricians and um, licensed LRT who want to get on a roof because electricians often don't want to get on a roof, right? They want to, right? They got to do new, new construction and that kind of stuff. So we have a honest bottleneck um, in being able to um, train um, train interested field personnel. Right, because we have 62 people on our apprentice waiting list, and a lot of solar companies who would like to hire. Um, I also, but I also think that um, when we look at the, you know, I just did the numbers on the LRT apprenticeship program, and if we only have women of color on our apprentice list, we will achieve parity in 25 years. For pe and people of color, it's it's um, 18 years. So um, we're that will not happen, right? We will not only, right? It won't. Be, so, but that's the also that I wanted you to have a sense of the level of um, what we're what we're facing in terms of equity. I, I really much. appreciate that, Michelle. Um, do you say 63 people on the waiting list for the 62? Uh, yes, 62. Wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which are while it's um, you know dominantly European American men, um, we do have twenty three percent right now on that waiting waiting list, which technically would be for people of color parity, right? If they all right, if it all, but what happens is because of the the LRTs are primarily right, the pool of LRTs are primarily European American male. Um, however, when it comes to women, we have four percent, and there's 
less than 4% in the field already for licensed positions. So, you know, there, um, there, there's some, you know, obvious um, struggles here. And um, OSEA and the LRT program are doing all it can, uh, all it has the capacity to do at the moment. I appreciate that so much. Thank you. Really helpful to to know what the what the challenges are. Uh, next, we have um, Marshall and then Tom. Thank you so much. Um, so prior to my stint in uh, the new political world here, I've only been doing this for a short time. Uh, I was an instructor at our apprenticeship program up here in Local 48. I uh, spent the last seven years doing that. So I, I have a pretty good handle of of some of the things that we've been doing right in our industry and then some of the places that we have an opportunity to um, maybe improve in the future. Um, so from the things that we've been doing correctly, uh, we introduced solar to our members back in 2005. We introduced electrical vehicle charging training back in 2010. We have a, a certified program for that uh, called EDITP that allows uh, us to send out installers that even though you just need a, a general journeyman license to go do that work, you can kind of specialize in that particular field. Um, so we feel like we're well poised to, to tackle the existing renewable markets right now. Um, couldn't tell you what the next change in technology is going to bring. And I, I think as, as we look at today, five years from now, 10 years from now, and really 20 years from now, as we go through and, and evolve and, and get to a cleaner climate, um, we don't even know all of the technologies that we're facing. But I, I feel like we have the people in place we have a, an industry leading apprenticeship program that's adaptable and flexible enough to get the information to our members as needed. Um, but what I do want to speak about is um, how we transition and get enough workers. I think, I think everybody on this call today feels the worker, worker crunch out there and the construction industry is not immune to this as well. Um, and we have a ranked list um, of about 750 people that would like to be apprentices and would like to be out on the job site. The problem is, is I can't put 750 brand new first term apprentices out on the job site tomorrow. And the reason for that is, is you spend the first year of your electrical apprenticeship essentially learning not to get squished by, you know, heavy equipment and fall off ladders and things of that nature. And it sounds, while it sounds really simplistic, it, it, construction sites are dangerous. So we have to maintain proper ratios. We have to make sure we have licensed folks working with mentoring and teaching and educating those apprentices. What I would ultimately like to see in, in our National Joint Apprenticeship Training Committee has, has looked into this as an option is moving potentially the first year of our apprenticeship into our high schools. And where if you're a senior in high school, let's take the first year of our apprenticeship, get us dialed in so that you know, we, we've taken a five-year program, we've made it now a four-year program to help streamline that and then get people interested and excited in the building trades. The building trades are a great way to the middle class. It's a great family wage job. Um, and we're proud of what we do in that regard, but we always have to be cognizant of, of the hiring needs and, and that'll allow us to continue our efforts um, to reach out to other, other areas that we need to improve upon. Excellent points, Marshall. Could you repeat the number of, of you said 650 people? We have about, so at any given point in time, we have about 750 members that would like, or people that would like to be apprentices. And, and that those are essentially people that have gone through our uh, application testing and they have passed that test. And then they sat for an interview. And then at that point, they're given a ranked number from one to whatever. And uh, we, we generally, what we're capable of processing in our um, training facility here in the Portland metro area is about 300 people a year. Um, that's, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head for statewide, but that's what we do here at the local level. Wow. And, and I, I know we're going to see the, the need increase even more. We look at the sort of industry-driven transition to electric vehicles, for example. Uh, that is going to be coming it, you know, sooner than we can imagine with the, the, uh, the, it, the efforts led by the auto industry to transition to electric vehicles. And we're going to see a, a tremendous increase in need for, for electricians through that. And with regard to the, the, the learning, uh, you, you mentioned the first year in high school, I've always mm -hmm. been a supporter of our career and technical education courses in, in our K-12 system and how important those are uh, to, to bring those opportunities to, to students. But it's, it's a great idea to, to look at 
whether we could start even earlier, uh, get get meet to meet the need out there. Uh, so thank you, Marshall. And next is Tom, and then Kelly. All right, thank you. Um, so I'll preface this that uh, my comments will probably sound a little bit less rosy and positive than everybody else's so far. Um, as a very analytical uh, PhD mechanical engineer uh, that's been uh, teaching for a lot of years, uh, I'll sort of start with the in the renewable energy program at PCC specifically. I would have a lot of people, uh, students, prospective students would ask me, well, what are the jobs I'm going to get? And in for those, and, and many people are, they want to stay in the area. The answer has generally been, well, you're going to basically um, install PV panels, uh, which is really good, and and, uh, and uh, basically do field service on them, or wind. There's lots of jobs in wind, but it's all field service if you want to climb towers. Um, or you're going to be in utilities um, or involved like an Energy Trust of Oregon or some administrative type of things where you're trying to bring tax breaks and start projects. But there isn't a lot in the, this particular area related to actual factories that are building things. Um, uh, representative, I'm from Pennsylvania too, Western Pennsylvania, where you know I understand the value of factories and really building things. And the fact is in the Oregon area, we don't have very much related to clean energy on that. We've lost all of our solar uh, manufacturers. I mean, the fact is the whole reason PV is so cheap is because China got into it and it's making it very cheap. We have some related to wind, but not a whole lot. Most of our jobs are really related to field service, putting new things on there. And again, while those are all great, one of the things that really struck me is what you, you said, Michelle, it's going to take 25 years just to get kind of some kind of parity on there. Well, the reason is because we're talking about dozens to hundreds of jobs. What we really need to be talking about is 10,000 jobs mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, so we just don't have that. So one thing I really... And then it's not in the current bill. I mean, that current bill with 3.4 billion highways and stuff, that's, that's a lot of civil stuff and it's all very good, but there's really not a lot that we're doing for um, really um, like manufacturing batteries or trying to get back to PV or wind turbines or um, synthetic fuels, clean diesel and things like that. Um, store, energy storage is huge. There's a lot of very good jobs there but they're pretty small as far as in this area, you know, like startup companies. We're great with startup companies, but there's not a whole lot there. So one of the things we really need to look at is how can we get to the fact that we're not just talking about hundreds of jobs, but 10,000 of jobs. Um, now that said, a couple of things that are really good. Um, Darren, I, Duran, I totally agree with what you're saying for, we spend a lot of time, and I personally spend a lot of my time really advocating STEM education and uh, especially with uh, women, Unless you get them elementary school, middle school, you've lost them because they've been told that, oh, they can't do that sort of stuff. So we really don't wait till yeah. high schools, get them down in there and really, really get them excited about the things you can do. Uh, other things that are really, really good that we've got potentially going on, microgrids. Uh, oh, there's this huge electrification is all the rage. And there's a lot of good things about it, but the fact is, it is not very good for resiliency when you talk about compared to having other types of fuels all there too. You know, imagine how many times um, electric grids go out. There's a lot of potential work that we could do with that, um, that both projects themselves and also designing things, getting people more in the engineering, electrical design and things like that, that we can do to really make it such that electrification is something that that works very well and is as resilient as we really need. Because right now, if we went all to electrification and electric vehicles, we'd be in trouble um, even getting it there, let alone if something big happens like the big earthquake. So a lot of good stuff for that. Again, uh, synthetic fuels, uh, clean diesel, some of those things to keep with resiliency and build factories would be good. Um, and let's see, I was gonna say, or something else. Oh. Construction, yes, Marshall, thank you very much. Actually, Northwest Engineering is primarily in the construction business for buildings. A lot of times when people are talking about, hey, I wanna be you know, clean energy and stuff, I say, one thing you should actually look at right now because jobs are really important and they're a little bit more available, especially in the area, is construction and uh, energy efficiency. The fact is, everybody will agree on energy efficiency. People might throw their arms up that, uh, why don't you let me use my nuclear or what's wrong with hydro, um, um, hydrothermal energy and things like that. But uh, everybody, 
will get behind electrical efficiency. And building is huge. The fact is, I've you know I've worked in a lot of uh, clean energy type fields. The first time I was involved in a big building where we saved 10% of electrical usage, I did more for the environment than all the fuel cells that I had ever actually installed. And electric and that can kind of construction stuff, having jobs, regardless of whether they're clean energy jobs specifically or not, we can really pitch that and really get people excited about it. So, I mean, I'm totally agreeing with Marshall, getting more people down into the uh, high school level, getting them trained so they're coming right out because that's a whole nother thing, which we only have time for. The idea of trying to get kids interested in college when they see how much college costs and what they're gonna do after that compared to they can just learn it on the internet and stuff. Um, that's a whole nother thing that, anyway, I've taken up a lot of time, so. Thanks. Well, great points, Tom. I really appreciate them. And uh, you're, you're right about the need for more uh, manufacturing, U.S. manufacturing, and uh, cer certainly the administration with the, a lot of that happens with the incentives and the tax code, for example. But really, you, you've made some great points about the importance of having uh, the other opportunities and the, the breadth of opportunities that are there. I want to note the Science, Space, and Technology Committee um, has, has really Really supported a significant amount of additional research where we've identified where do we need more research and development that's academic but it can be broader so i really appreciate the the, the breadth of information you brought and your ideas uh, gives gives us a lot to think about and a lot to work on kelly Dr. Suman, I, I i appreciate all the comments that are being shared here today and i want to encourage us to not settle for what the projections look like around equity i myself am not willing to wait for 10 years or five years or 70 years for parity. And while I agree that uh, education at the middle and high school level is really important uh, for women and girls, our average age that we serve is 34 at Oregon Tradeswomen. And those women go to successful careers in the clean energy economy and in the construction sector. And 75% of them are going into union pathways. Why? Because that is what makes a difference. So when we think about thoughtful, strategic public policy, I think about Congresswoman Bonamici and how she put science behind the legislation that she advances and how she's advancing not only a clean energy economy vision, but also coupling that with a, a advancing a care economy. Because in order for us to remedy our decades of inequities in this country, we need to lead with an equity lens. So I applaud her for that. And I encourage all of us to work better together, to collaborate more, right. because when we do that and we leverage our own resources and assets together, things like uh, Oregon Tradeswoman working with Local 48, and the apprenticeship and training, we've seen the numbers shift. So there's almost 25% minorities in the apprenticeship program, uh, BIPOC uh, job seekers and trades workers, and over 15% women. And that's not by accident, that's by intentionality. So I believe we can do better and I know we can do better together. Great message, Kelly. I absolutely agree with you. We can, and, and uh, this uh, conversation is inspiring. So thank you so much, Brooke. Thanks. I just want both uh, Kelly and Tom, I wanted to dovetail on what both of them said. Um, I th The resiliency and the reliability component of this transition is very important, as is uh, affordability, right? So all of those things together are really important. And obviously, as an electric utility, those are paramount as we transition for our customers and ensuring, you know, public policy is supporting everybody working together towards this transition. That includes things like utilities being able to access tax benefits, like the toll, the solar tax credit. Thank you, Congresswoman, for helping um, include that in the bill, and also things like normalization opt out. Those are all things that help uh, keep the affordability for our customers as we transition. And really looking at how are we helping build that workforce all the way around, right? So what are the utility jobs that are able to be brought forward? How are we working with our union partners and our pre-apprenticeship partners to help build out the workforce and the areas that they are so that this is a transition that holistically the energy sector is looking at rather than kind of siloed uh, look forward. So I think that's a really key important part is how are we working? And I like to say we're rowing in the same direction. How are we all rowing in the same direction? <laughs> because I think we all we're hearing we all have the same ultimate goal. But how do we do it in a way that makes sure that we're bringing everybody along in that transition? Really great points, Brooke. I appreciate that so much. Uh, as we we're getting short on time, anyone else have anything to add? Before I close it out? 
Well, I just want to say thank you so much. These are these are complex issues, but very, very important. And I'm really grateful for your expertise and your experience that everyone brought to this conversation today. You know, sometimes it, it feels challenging when we look at something as monumental as transitioning uh, to a clean energy economy. But when we see the effects of climate change firsthand, we know we need to take action. And uh, your, your input, your conversation, your work uh, makes me feel optimistic that we can and come together and, and make this happen. Uh, I will bring your insights. Uh, if you have any, any more stories, please send them in. Uh, sometimes when we when I talk with colleagues and we're, if we're talking about policy in the abstract, it's not, not nearly as uh, compelling as when we tell a story about what it means to the driver of the electric bus or what it means to the people who live in an apartment building where their energy costs are, are low. So uh, I'll bring those with, with me and we'll continue to watch for action at the Senate. So thank you everyone so much. Really appreciate all you're doing. Take care, have a great holiday. Thanks for your time, Congressman. Yeah. Bye-bye now. Thank, thank you. you.